Hi everyone! Welcome to Bespoke. This is a format that started on my Instagram at the beginning of the pandemic where we came together every night and I answered questions and we talked about things that mattered to you. I wanted to extend this format to my YouTube and to my industry friends who can talk about things that matter to them, things that I might not know about, or answer just questions that we all have. I hope that you will enjoy this new format every single week and I'm excited to bring to you the first episode now with two of my wonderful friends and co-founders of the Black and Fashion Council, Lindsay Peoples-Wagner and Sandrine Charles. I'm very excited to welcome my first two guests ever, I will never forget this moment, Lindsay Peoples-Wagner hey guys. and Sandrine Charles. Hi! So who wants to go first? Tell us about yourself. I'm the editor of Teen Vogue and co-founder of Black and Fashion Council. My name is Sandrine Charles. I'm like a 12-year plus industry professional. I work on elevated streetwear, menswear brands, uh, elevated streetwear women, sneakers, accessories, lifestyle. And I'm also the co-founder of the Black and Fashion Council. I guess, tell us first, starting, like, how, how you both came together and you're like, okay, we're doing this. We've been friends for a couple of years. Um, I've known Lindsay since I was still at agency. And we were just talking about the state of, you know, the, the culture and the environment and what we're seeing on Instagram. So we jumped on a phone call and then... We got our friends and our peers involved in a larger phone call, which was a Zoom, which was like 80 people. And then we had a follow-up one, and the council kind of was birthed through those conversations and seeing where there was a lack thereof or synergy for us. And we just wanted to do something to stop having the same conversation. So your mission statement says that you seek to represent and secure the advancement of Black individuals in the fashion and beauty industry. Um, can you just expand on this a bit and tell us more about what you hope to accomplish both in the short term, but most importantly, in the long term? You know, when I wrote the piece for The Cut about what it's like to be Black in fashion, it was over 150 people that I had talked to and really explaining everyone's narratives of how they felt. And when we were talking, it was like, look, it's been almost two years. You know, we've all shared what's going on. And I think one of the interesting things for me was that, like, in having conversations with everyone, it really felt like, you know, long therapy sessions, but also um, so many people had similar experiences or were going through a lot of the same things that weren't even friends or didn't even know each other or work in the same part of the industry. And I think there was so many, there was so much power in numbers in that, but then also the realization that like, we're all going through this and how do we actually move it forward? And I think the conversations that Sandrine and I were having were, you know, how do we actually secure this and make this something that has to be a policy that is put into practice and not just something that we continue to talk about? Because I think we had we really felt strongly about, OK, well, we've talked about it and we've posted about it on social media and we've done all these things and we're vocal about it. But like, how do we actually make industry wide systematic change? And that's really where when the birth of Black and Fashion Council came about. If a company signs on to be in the Black and Fashion Council or a partner, what are the next steps? We really set it up as far as, you know, working with companies that were not coming at it from, a, 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 you know, a stance of trying to cancel you or tell you what to do and run your business. Really, we've, mm -hmm. we've said to businesses, you know, let us know the three areas in which you really want to work on, improve, need our help with, feedback, counsel, um, to amplify whatever it is. And then we go from there and make a plan with each business. I wondered if you had experienced any criticism from people who have a more radical viewpoint when it comes to change um, and in terms of rolling out uh, a message and bringing people on board. It's just a personal question I have, but feel free to expand. We've been blessed with a really great advisory board and I give so much credit to them because um, they've really encouraged and supported Sandrine and I a lot in this. And I remember really early on, I had a conversation with Mama Beth Ann about just our approach and how we were going about it. And, you know, she said like, you know, you're not going to make everyone happy with this, but you're going to make change. And that's what you're doing this for. So it is what it is. I think we were, we've always been really, um, you know, goal oriented and really focused on what we're trying to accomplish with this. And the way that we set it up, I think we really just wanted to make sure that 
especially in this culture, it felt like so many people and, and are extremely emotional and rightfully so, everything is terrible in the world and I get it, but it feels like people are just like looking to cancel people and looking to find flaws in people. And at the end of the day, like the reality I think is like, you know, we do love fashion, we love what we're doing. Um, I still wanna work in the industry. And I think that it really, for me was like, okay, how do we make this something that we can really make sure that people feel like they can rise to the occasion of changing and not feel like we're shaming them into it or like making them do it. We're not forcing brands to do anything. We're not like emailing brands being like, hey, you haven't reached out to us. Like we're not, it's literally like, come or don't. And I think that that approach of just allowing people to, you know, there there is a resource, there is access, there is something for you is at least, you know, offering to the industry. And especially because we have, you know, when brands sign up, they're signing on for three years, we, we've we set it up to really say, okay, like, we're going to challenge you and, and really, you know, have these hard conversations to see change, but like, at least we will actually see change and progress. And I think, um, Sandra and I have talked a lot about, you know, it's hard, I think, especially as women of color in this space, because people want change like now. And a lot of this is the long game. Like a lot of this is we're fighting things that have been in place and racism, classism, elitism that has been in the industry before we were alive. Share a little bit about how you go from like an idea to action. I think some of the things that you've talked all the way through in terms of making a plan and how you roll that out, like once you sort of planted the seed, you, you did you sort of like start together in June, but then you rolled out in August, right? Yeah, we also needed to get the, the legal together. Um, you know, we're not running a business that's just an idea. We own it 50-50. And we're, you know, we're going to have a nonprofit component of the company. We're, we're, we have a board. We have a membership committee. We were building all of this out. So to, you know, to echo Lindsay's point, a lot of people want things now, but you know, in order to go through a thousand applications, a committee needs to be set forth. And those people are dedicating their time for free. You know, in terms of like the executive board pulling together all of these experts in this space, we're, you know, we're almost at a hundred brands. We obviously, you know, would love the support. So we have to pull in our peers to support us. So when people look at an idea or what you know, they hope to garner for us for it. For us, it was never about the press. The press was nice to get it out, but we had to pull the plan in motion. And it did take us two months to flesh everything out to finally announce that we're finally operating on August 3rd. And also just, just research how to start a business or like I learned my business acumen from running a department at two different agencies and learning how that works before I would, would even think to start my company. Because if you don't have the back end and that backbone, it's all like smoke and mirrors on the surface. So also noting like you should learn the back end of whatever type of business you're trying to own and operate. What are the biggest challenges or struggles that you face since launching the council? I think it's just us plan doing a lot of planning together. We're doing a lot of planning that I'm sure if this was like a larger company or any of the, you know, the foundations I sit on the board for, there's a lot of lead time. And I think because people saw the press, they expect that Lindsay and I have like all of these like plans just ready to go all the time, but we're using our time outside of our office hours to do this. So if we're walk, working nine to six, six to 12, we're working on that. You, I'm sure you saw the Wells Fargo CEO's recent assertion that there is a quote, limited pool of black candidates to recruit from. Um, and I'm curious in your work with brands and larger corporations, is this an excuse that you've heard often in regards to their past diversity efforts? Is this something that you are hearing frequently? Um, this is something that drives me nuts, personally. It seems a bit strange that that would be a response from a public, but continue. I mean, I just think that people don't even understand, like, I, it drives me nuts because I think even, if I think about myself as someone who grew up in Wisconsin and wasn't around anything fashion, like, I am so blessed and fortunate that I got exposed early on in college. Most Black kids don't even know that these jobs are jobs. Like, you can't even 
you can't complain about pipeline issues if you're not actually doing anything to fix it from the beginning. Like I didn't know, honestly, I didn't even know about being an editor in chief until I started watching the Hills. That's why I talk about it so much because it was such a formative thing for me of like, oh my gosh, you can do this. You can work in a magazine, you can do this. And then, you know, I, I just think people don't understand, especially in marginalized communities, like that exposure early on affects your trajectory to be able to even, you know, get the right degree or get the internship to get the experience to actually get the job. Like you can't complain about there not being a pipeline and you're not doing anything to fix it. For people who are resistant to sort of put their things that are important to them, um, issues that matter to them, like out in the forefront, like what what would be... Is, have you seen from a brand side that that helps or hurts a brand, really? Have you seen, you know, I think one thing, I've said this to you separately, Lindsay, that Teen Vogue does really well. So many of my friends who are not in the demographic technically go to Teen Vogue for their news, for issues that they care about. And I think that that is really, you know, you you making that a focal point has really, I think, from my perspective, sort of helped it to grow. So you know, I'm, I'm wondering, like, if you, like, what is to lose, really? And what have you seen on your side, on both sides? I would say from a media standpoint, people have been too traditional in putting people in boxes of, like, who is this reader and who is this reader? And we spend a lot of time, like, making up, you know, when you do an edit test for all these jobs, like, you, you know, make up all of these, like, okay, like, your number one reader is Maria and she lives here and she's this age and she's engaged in this and this is what she does in her daily life. And you go through all of these scenarios of like actually painting a picture of who your reader is. But I think traditional media, especially um, I think fashion publications have been very like, okay, we're fashion. So like our reader only cares about these things. And if you're, you know, um, other publications, you kind of have a wider range of space to say, okay, we can talk about this beauty brand maybe, or like maybe we talk about politics or maybe we talk about climate change. And my perspective was always that, you know, we want to be there for young people and we want to be there for that really core audience, but we also really just want to talk about things that are culturally relevant. And I think that a lot of that thinking of that you can only be one thing and one thing is is really old age. I mean, we all know that we're multifaceted human beings. I really love fashion, but I also really do care about the election. And I think it doesn't have to be as it used to be. It really was like mutually exclusive. And now I think, you know, it is a definite understanding that you can care and be passionate about a lot of different things mm -hmm. and really honing in on that. And really, I think our reader cares about the world and has empathy. And, and that's who I am. So. I wonder if sometimes the hesitation to, not even in context of the council, but to publicly discuss where your company is at, um, where what your company looks like internally, what your company can do better. I, I, I wonder if you've seen or felt that the hesitation to sort of put that out there is that, you know, being forthcoming with that information could then uh, reflect poorly or negatively on them or that organization, which could then affect the bottom line and the dollars or put them into a canceled position or whatever that is, you know, and I wonder, you know, and that's, that's on many different things. Um, obviously we're seeing that as well with the election, but I'm just wondering your, your thoughts on that. You don't see people just out here supporting brands and wearing brands and, you know, talking about brands or, or giving them their time of day unless they really feel like they connect with that brand and it really aligns with their ethos, you know, as a human being. And so I think that companies really have to realize that that is going to be a huge shift um, in who shoppers really are and, and really how they want to spend their money and leaning into accountability and transparency is not saying that like you should be canceled. It's just saying that you're being accountable for your actions. It's transparent that everyone makes Makes mistakes, but also accountable for actually taking actions to move forward. And I think that that that's a duality with brands just in general. Once a lot of the brands that we are speaking to don't necessarily have the best trajectory. However, they're being very transparent on where they have fallen short and where they'd like to move forward. So I think that's also encouraging for you know, their consumer base or their network to see that they're taking accountability for what has happened in the past and making strides to be better. But I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on, on what those corporations and small brands can do to support their employees of color when the news cycle is consistently 
um, traumatic and difficult to process? Speaking for myself as a manager, I really try to just make sure that, you know, if people need to take some time or they need to take a day or it's like, okay, we still need to get on these calls, but like, you don't have to be on video or like we can end the day earlier or whatever it is. I think just little acts of kindness and grace, as Sandrine was saying earlier, I think go a long way. I've had, you know, I've had family members pass away. I've had a ton of, you know, people on my staff. They've had a ton of, they've had deaths in their family as well. Um, also on top of the election, also on top of, you know, Breonna Taylor, like it, it's so many things happening all the time. And I think just being aware of that and being aware that like, you know, it's a time for people that they really just have heavy hearts. Um, and it, it is just a lot, but just understanding that. And I think having that empathy as a manager, um, it, it really helps. And it really shows, I think, when people feel like, okay, you know, if I'm not completely on today, it's okay. And I think we, we are, we get a lot of these, like, you know, we have to be on all these calls and like, it's like perfection expected and really high expectations, I think in fashion to look a certain way and be a certain type of way and all that. But um, I really have been trying to focus on how I feel and how my life feels and how I feel about everything around me and not, you know, concerned with how it looks. Just in general, compassion lacks in our industry. It's like, okay, I, I literally just had to put my out of office up because something happened in my family and I immediately text Lindsay, but then people were like, Oh, you're not going to join my call. Like, like my out of office says I have a family emergency. <laughs> so it's just being cognizant of like, you know, not only the landscape, but being a good human being, we all have work to do, but allow people to have a moment of grace to recollect themselves and then come back to the table with, you know, some results. What is the difference between opportunity and equity? Giving someone the opportunity, like getting them in the door is one thing. Building them up and, you know, giving them a chance to, like we always say this, your, what's your pipeline? You know, I can go in as an assistant, but do I feel like I can stay here throughout the bulk of my career and get into C-suite? Am I getting, you know, stocks offered to me within the company? Are you offering me equity as your comps person? Do you feel like I'm beneficial to the growth. It's not just like the access to get the job, but it's like, okay, the access to have the connections, to be chosen for certain things, to be um, to be promoted, you know, to be, you know, sought out. And I think they, a lot of times it just stops at people being like, oh, well, if you can get your foot in the door, but it's like, there's a lot of people of color I know that got their foot in the door and then they stayed at that door for six years as an assistant. And it's like, you can't, especially, you know, if you're not, if you don't come from a wealthy family, you can't afford to just be in these assistant roles and these junior roles forever and ever and amen. And a lot of it is really, I think, you know, making sure that people are put in a position of success and people are actually, you know, having an investment in you and wanting to see you grow and like taking action against that. How do you see the fashion industry operating in the next five years? And like, what would you as two trailblazing very successful women in your industry? Like what also would you say to young people coming behind you? Like change is coming. It might not be immediate, but like even what we're doing, it's a three year minimum. We're spending three years with these brands to align on this systematic change that would be like applied to every single company. So we would hope in three years that at least 98% are actively you know, implementing these changes and being more proactive so that the next generation that are in high school now going into college have a better opportunity at internships, a better pipeline to do apprenticeship um, interviews, you know, all of those opportunities that might just feel like far and few between um, will better equip them and these companies can better accept them, uh, flaws and all, on, on, on protocol process and um, any forthcoming opportunity. We've all made our lives in fashion and our careers in fashion. I'm wondering what you feel is, is really the purpose of this industry. You know, I think, is it to sell a dream? And if so, what what is the dream supposed to look like? Or is it to reflect the world that we live in? You know, and I think that where I have 
you know, struggled the most personally with myself just fitting into the industry is just sort of like um, projecting or selling dreams to people that, you know, we know are not real, <laughs> you know, um, that we know are not, that's not really the way it looks. Um, and as, you know, sort of everything has come to a halt and the world has come crashing down and as much as the industry is continuing on with shows and continuing to go on as if nothing has occurred because that's what happens in this industry is don't look broken, just look beautiful. I wonder if you have any sort of like bigger thoughts on where it's going and what it really should be for. I think about this a lot in a lot of different ways. I would say uh, specifically from working at magazines, I always felt like, you know, we can aspire to want to wear a certain thing or look a certain way, but that that aspiration should also be reflecting culture. Um, and also I've always just been a personal fan of high and low. I think the, you know, selling the idea that like you need to be head to toe drip designer has always been uh, the weirdest facade to me because there are a ton of obviously wealthy people in fashion, but I know a ton of people in fashion who are broke because they're trying to keep up the look. And it doesn't make sense to me because I think that we like in the industry, we know that. So I don't understand why we would even perpetuate just like spend all your money on shoes. Like why? Because you watched Sex in the City, like she couldn't even afford that lifestyle. And so I, I think there is a weird disconnect, but I also spend a lot of time, even with our shoots at Teen Vogue, it's like, I'm never just, we're never just doing something because it's like, that's the thing that you should like expire, aspire to have right now. And I remember, I mean, I don't, I don't love magazines as much as I used to, but sometimes when I read magazines, they always have these pages that are like, oh, buy this, buy this trench coat. This is the one thing that you need to buy. And it's like, but why? Like what, like, is it because this is like really expensive or this is this brand or is this an advertiser or, and I think about a lot, like what it means to be a good shopper. And, and by good, I mean, someone who's like really intentional and really thoughtful about like how you're spending your money and what that means for our reader. Because I mean, we can talk about climate change all day long, but like on obviously like that means like you should be buying less things, but like things that you really care about. And I just think that we have it, a lot of these like, th these ideas jumbled up in a cloud of what you should aspire to be. And I think a lot of it is cutting through that noise, especially in magazines and figuring out a way to have real conversations with people. Okay, lastly, are you hopeful about the future as we sit 30 something days until the election of our lifetimes? Are you hopeful today about the industry and the world at large? I think 30 days out, I hope that people who claim they are voting for who they are voting for, vote for them. I think that's very important. I think this whole, like, I'm going to be this person on social media, but behind closed doors, like, I can't wait for you to be a handmaid kind of mentality isn't cool. Um, because it's like you understand the people that you're voting for also affect you, right? And then on the other side of the coin, I think um, I'm very optimistic and excited for uh, changes in the industry. I think that Lindsay and I would not be working tirelessly on this if we didn't believe that. Um, and hopefully that everything, you know, works in the favor of the greater good of our, again, community. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it, it's hard. I mean, I've if we're speaking specific, specifically about the election, I've gone down the many scenarios as the way my anxiety works. I like to know all of the ways in which things can happen. Um, and also, we just need to be prepared um, because we're going to be working a Team Vogue, obviously, that night. And so we need to be prepared for a lot of different things that could happen. But I mean, I, I do. I agree 100 percent with Sandrine. Like, I want to see people actually going to go vote or get their mail in balance in on time and properly secured. Uh, I, I think a lot of it is. Yeah, a lot of it is like people know they can talk a game on social media, but you don't really know what people are doing behind closed doors. You don't know what people are really like. In real life, and people on social media can talk a really good game, and then you see them in person, and you're like, "Wait, what?" So, yeah. 
I, I do think that that's a key thing in the election, but also in the industry. I think that people really have to to walk that talk and they really have to commit to inclusivity and all these things in a real way. Lindsay, Sandrine, I want to thank you both so much for coming and being my first guest on my very first Bespoke. Um, I want to thank you as my friends, but also I want to thank you as someone who's in this industry for the work that you're doing. Um, and I can't wait till I have you on again. Hopefully it's going to be like in a television studio on a real show and we will play this back and we will always remember when you were my first guest with wine. Um, I love you both so much and thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in person soon. Love you. Thank you. Love you, Brandon.